Uh, tonight, um, I know Christmas can be one of the most wonderful times of the year. But I know for many of us, it can actually be an extremely difficult time as well. And so honestly, it's a time where we just simply need comfort. Have you ever been there before where you just need comfort from the Lord? Yeah. Well, that is what tonight's message is really all about. And so out of respect of God's Word, I encourage you to just stand along with me. And uh, we're going to read one verse tonight from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to be, this is kind of going to be our source text tonight. I like to run all throughout the Word of God, so we'll do that as well. But 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 3. It says this, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. And so that's what we're going to kind of use as our springboard tonight with a message I've simply titled, The God of All Comfort. So let's ask the Lord's blessing tonight, that it'll be a special blessing to those of us who need God's comfort tonight. And if we don't need it tonight, let me just encourage you, you will, okay? So let's just go to the Lord real quick. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to open up your word, Lord, before your people. Lord, I ask, Lord, that your word, Lord, would speak to our hearts tonight. Lord, that tonight, Lord, honestly, Lord, we could change how we look at trials, how we could change how we look at difficult times. Lord, because, Lord, we know that you alone are the God of all comfort. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And Lord, I thank you once again for this opportunity to preach it. And, Lord, I ask, Lord, tonight, Lord, that the words that I say through your word, Lord, would impact people tonight as well. And, Lord, we thank you so much for it. And we pray this all in the wonderful name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. All right. So as we look at this tonight, the God of all comfort, my my points are not alliterated, so just get that out of your mind. They're not even close. I do kind of have a similar theme, and you'll catch it, okay? So point number one is simple, the need of comfort. I think if we're going to talk about the God of all comfort, first of all, we have to understand that there is a very real need for comfort in our life. Okay, if you don't know this, I'm going to bear some bad news at the very beginning of this. Pain and suffering will come. Okay, it is inevitable in the life, in our life. How many of you have ever gone through pain and discomfort and pain and trials? Just, just raise your hand, okay? I think all of us tonight, if you didn't raise your hand, either you're lying or you've had a really great life, and I hope it doesn't change, okay? But pain and suffering will come. Now, what are the causes of this? Number one, sin, okay? Simply put, sin is a cause of pain and suffering in our life. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, and you could really go to a lot of different passages on this, on this point here. But it says this, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered in the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So why did death come? Because one man sinned. Who is that one man? Adam. Okay? So because of Adam, we are all now sinners. And because of that, we will die. And because of that, we will have pain, we will have suffering. So number two, okay? So what else could be a cause of pain and suffering in our life? Simply serving Christ. Did you know that? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Again, it says this, Yea, and all that, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It doesn't say might. Okay? It says, shall. It will happen. Okay? So this is a very real part of our life. Sin causes it. Serving Christ causes it. But also, did you know this? That growth also is a cause of pain and suffering in our life. Josiah, Michaela, both of them have gone through growth spurts, and both of them scream like wild banshee Indians whenever they go through it, okay? It hurts. I can remember... In about seventh grade, I grew six inches in one summer, and I can remember waking up in the middle of the night, just grabbing my knee and just screaming bloody murder because it just hurt. Growth causes pain and suffering. I want you to go here. I want you to go with this, this verse in your Bible, okay? First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. The verse we're going to look at in First Peter chapter 5 is verse number 10. I want, you to, I want you to see the wording here, okay? I know it's on the screen, 
but I think sometimes it's nice to look at it in, the, in our Bible. Here it is. It says this, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. What is that? That is growth. Okay? After you have suffered a while, make you perfect, okay? mature, growing in Christ, established, established in the faith, steadfast, if you will, strengthen, settle you. All of that okay, happens because of what happened at the end of that, right before that. Okay, so I've suffered a while. After you've suffered a while, it, it, growth hurts. Okay, it does. And we've already looked at this verse, but look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, turn there too. I want you to see it. That God is the source of all comfort. Comfort doesn't come from anything else. Comfort doesn't come from time. Comfort doesn't come because now I've all of a sudden replaced whatever that was that I lost. No, comfort comes from God. Look at this verse again. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Okay, if I could steal something from Mason tonight. Pastor Holmes said this. All means all, and that's all that all means. Now, now it's not just Pastor Holmes. I had professors in college, Pastor Holmes had professors in college, who said this as well. But all means all, and that's all that all means. You don't have to do a massive study of the word all. It means all. So when 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 says, and the God of all comfort, guess what it means? He's the God of all comfort. Okay, it's not complicated. The God of all comfort. There is no true comfort apart from God. So when we go through difficult times, when, when we lose someone we love, guess where comfort comes? It's not from our strength. It's from our God. Amen. We, ha we have to think about that. And I understand Christmas can be extremely, extremely difficult. Christmas is going to be hard for my grandma. It's going to be hard for my dad, no doubt. But here's the thing. Comfort comes from God. So if we know Jesus Christ as our Savior, we can truly have comfort. Okay? I know this is very, very complex so far. But here's the amazing truth of comfort. Letter A. Comfort is meant to be passed on. Comfort is meant to be passed on. Look at the very next verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. It says this. Now, remember, verse 3, it ended with the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So what happens here? God comforts us, and then we then are supposed to pass that comfort on, the lessons we have learned, to someone else. Could it be that the trial you have gone through this year was for one purpose and one purpose alone, to pass on the things that God has taught you to someone else? I believe that oftentimes in our Christian life, this is the very purpose of the trial that we go through. I firmly believe that. That the purpose for the trial that I have gone through is so that I then can teach other people what God taught me. Did you know that that is actually a scriptural principle? And we're going we're to get into that in a second. But underneath this, I want you to understand, don't ever think that the trial you have gone through is because God hates you. Okay? He doesn't. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Okay, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Again, this is one of those passages that we, we could go all throughout the scripture to find proof text, okay? But Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says this, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now that kind of love doesn't just go away. Okay, That kind of love, a love where you will actually give yourself for someone else, doesn't just melt away. 
Okay? So when I go through trials, it is not because God hates me. Okay? Remember, trials can be a great source of growth. Okay? The suffering I go through can be a great time of growth. All right? So it's not because God hates me. He doesn't hate me. He loves me more than I could comprehend. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Okay, it says this. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The appeasement, okay, for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Now, what is, the, what is, what is John trying to say? He's saying, look, God loved us. We didn't initiate this relationship. God did. And then what are we supposed to do? We are supposed to love each other with the love that God now has offered us. Okay? So, as we think about 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, who comforteth us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort the, them, right, who are in any trial, what is the lesson here? God taught us a lesson. God initiated the, the relationship so that now I can pass it on to somebody else. Now, I think, I think this is a place where I, okay, if I'm going to be honest tonight, I epically fail. Okay? What I do is God teaches me a lesson, and I go, thanks God, I got the lesson. And I don't share with anybody else. Okay? I think oftentimes in the Christian church, this is where we live, okay, in, in America. Where God does something in our life, and we keep it for ourselves. That is not what God wants us to do. And we're going to look at this in a little bit later. There, there's some very clear teachings in the Old Testament that show us that we are supposed to pass it on to the next generation. We are supposed to teach them what God has done. And I think that is a very clear Bible doctrine that you and I are supposed to do. Okay? You look at our teenagers. Okay? They, they love the Lord. They honestly do. But you know what they need more than anything else? They need some of us adults to take them and say, this is what God has taught me in this trial. Some of you adults have gone through trials I cannot understand. Okay? I will never understand unless I go through it. But you can teach our teenagers, our children, how to go through it. So that then, when that trial comes, or when that trial is there, they already have knowledge and understanding of what God can teach them. And guess what? They are now ahead of you at that point in the trial. It's an amazing thing. It, it works where we are actually teaching each other so that then the next generation is actually further along in the faith than we are. If God loved you enough to send his son to die for your sins, God certainly does not hate you. Okay? I think that's pretty obvious. He, he would never, he, d he does not send trials because he hates you. He didn't send trials to Job because he hated him. Now number two, another don't ever, don't ever think that the trial you went through is just because it just happened. It's a mistake. Okay? I, I want you to think about this. Even if you don't see a purpose in the trial you're going through, God has one. Okay? I want you to think about that. Even though I may not see the purpose of the trial I'm going through, God has one. Amen. Romans chapter 11 Verses 33 through 34. Now, the teenagers know this. I absolutely love the book of Romans. Okay, I say that every time we go to the book of Romans. Okay, but I had to do that tonight for you guys. Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 34. It says this. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor? Now, I love that last part where it says, who hath been his counselor? Basically saying, who says, hey, God, I think you're making a mistake, right? And no one, no one with a right mind would ever say that to an almighty God who knows everything, who is all-powerful, who is omnipresent. No one would ever say that. But I think that is often what we think, right? Where you go, God, you know, I, I've been serving you. I've been doing what you want me to do. Why would you allow this into my life? Why would this come? God is so far above and beyond what you and I could even comprehend. Okay? I want you to understand that tonight. God is. He is beyond anything I could even think. And so when God 
allows a trial into my life, he may have a purpose in it, and I may not see it, but what I have to do is I have to say, God, I don't get it, but I trust you. I don't understand what's going on in my life, but God, I trust you. God, I believe you. That is a big thing to do in trial. It is very difficult, but that is where we have to be. Point number three, okay, or underneath this, I guess. Yeah. Don't ever think that God left you during the trial, that God just abandoned you. That's not scriptural. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6 says this, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what men shall do unto me. What is the purpose of God saying, I will not leave you? So that I can say, Lord, the Lord is my helper, and I'm not going to fear what man can do unto me. Amen. Why does God say, I'm not going to leave you? Because then I can say, look, through God's help, I can make it through. Okay? No matter what the trial is, no matter how difficult it is, I may not be able to comprehend what trials are in my future, but the reality is, my God is in control, and he is there. Okay, letter B underneath point number two. If you're taking notes, I like to make it very simple. Suffering is never a waste. Did you know that? Suffering is never meant to be just a wasted opportunity. Suffering is always meant to be a teachable moment for others. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 once again. And we're going to read, I didn't give you this verse, David, but verse 5 as well. It says this, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. We'll talk about what that consolation means in just a second. But, and whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. So we see a word there that kind of seems like it doesn't quite fit, but consolation. Consolation is comfort, right? Where you're consoling somebody. You're helping them through something. And so what is the Apostle Paul saying here? He says, and whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation, your comfort and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Paul's going through suffering, right? Or whether we be comforted, it is for your comfort, consolation, and salvation. So what he's saying, he's saying, look, when I go through something, when I go through difficult times, Apostle Paul talking, right? When I am stoned, or when I am beaten, or when I am shipwrecked, or you fill in the blank, okay, for the Apostle Paul, it is for your comfort. Why? The Apostle Paul was able to come into the church, who is going through persecution as well, and go, look what God did for me, and if he can take care of me, he can take care of you. So what is Paul doing? He is living out 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. He's living it out. When I go through difficult times, it's not supposed to just be a teachable moment for me. It is supposed to be a teachable moment for Brother Dave, for Pastor Holmes, for my wife, for Charles, for Kayla, for all of us. That is what it is supposed to be. When I go through pain, when I go through difficult times, it is meant to be something that can be teachable to someone else. I think, I think this is such an important aspect of our life. I think it is very clear here in the very beginning of 2 Corinthians chapter 1 that Paul's trying to get a point across that it is meant to be passed on. Go to Psalm 145, verse number 4. I think this is a great, great verse for us to think about how we pass things on to the next generation. Look at it. Okay, it's already up there. One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. So what's going on here? God provides, God does mighty acts for one generation, and you were supposed to teach it to another. Did that, was that supposed to happen in the nation of Israel? Yes, right? They set up monuments, they set up stones, so that then when 
The kids would walk by. They'd say, hey, Dad, what are these stones here for? Well, that is when God did this. And that, man, you should have seen it. It was incredible. It, that was what it was meant to be. Did the nation of Israel do a really great job at it? No. They did not. I didn't include these verses, but you look at the end of Joshua where it talks about how the, the gen, how the nation of Israel served God all the days of Joshua and all, all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua. And then you look at the beginning of Judges, and it says, but there grew up a generation which knew not God, nor the mighty works which he had done for Israel. And what happened? That generation, Joshua's generation, did not pass it on to the next. And what happened? They fell into sin. And they started having a massive cycle of sin and rebellion and then God judging them and then deliverance. And you see this massive cycle that goes through all the book of Judges. Why? Because one generation didn't teach the next. And you know what my fear is? This, is? this is my biggest fear. That that happens for the teens who are sitting over here. Okay? Or there. Right? Or there. Okay, I'm trying to find them all. Okay? That that's what happens that we have seen God do great things here at this place. We saw what God can do through a man who is faithful in, at this pulpit, who preaches the word faithfully, who loves the Lord. And what would happen if all of a sudden we go, eh, I don't need to teach my kids. They'll grow up, and they won't know what God has done in the past. And you know what they'll do? Leave the faith. There is, there is a scary, scary statistic, and I won't bore you with it, but it talks about how kids, teenagers, grow up in Christian churches, and the, the number, the percentage of ones that just leave the church and never come back. It scares, if there is one thing that scares the snot out of me more than anything else in ministry, it's that. That I can pour my life into these teenagers and I can preach the word faithfully. And, and we can do all these great things. And we can have outreaches. And we can have discipleship class. And we can do activities. And then all of a sudden, something just clicks off and they just leave. You know what? They probably didn't have a really great relationship with Christ while they were in our house, which I think is key. But then also it could be that you and I, who may not be their parents, aren't sharing what God did in our lives to them. So it's not just their mom and dad saying, hey, look at what God did in my life. It's us. I've realized this with ministry. This, this drives me insane. But I can preach a message to the teenagers from the same text, exactly the same way, maybe not exactly the same way, but very close. And then some other pastor or evangelist can preach exactly the same message. And all of our teens are like, what? I never heard that before. Yes, you did. You heard it two weeks ago. Right? But why, why does that happen? Because sometimes it just takes a different voice. And guess what, adults? We can be that other voice. God has taught us lessons. Let's share it. Okay, I tell, I tell the sponsors all the time, the people that help me back in youth group, I say, look, if a teenager likes you more than me, I'm not deeply offended. I may cry at home, but that's okay. But... If they like you more than me, that's fine. Minister to them. Love on them. Share the love of Christ. Impact their life. Why? Because it's not about me. It's about him. Okay? What we did in the, the youth takeover service, it was not about me. Okay? And my great choir leading skills, which are terrible. Okay? Dave knows. I mean, Blair knows. He knows that. <laughs> He's like back there laughing. Okay? It's not that. It's about God. Okay? So we just have to understand that, that my, my life is not meant to be just hoarded to myself. Pastor said this once before. He said, we are to be conduits of blessing, and we are to be conduits of comfort, and we are to be conduits of what God taught us, or we are to simply a pass-through, where it comes in, and it flows right out to somebody else. Okay? Now, this verse is not on the screens, because I want you to see it. Okay? But this is a very big truth. I want you to see it in your, in your Bible. So go to Romans chapter 8. Okay, Romans chapter 8. This is such an important understanding that we, we have to understand. That the suffering I face cannot compare to my future. Okay? The suffering I face cannot compare to my future. Romans chapter 8, verse number 18. Okay, it says this. 
For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The Apostle Paul says, look, for I reckon, I recognize, I understand that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The Apostle Paul is saying this, my stonings, my beatings, my shipwrecks, my prison time cannot even come close to what God is doing in my life and what God has for my future, which is heaven, right? So, have you been stoned before? I haven't, okay? I haven't been shipwrecked. I haven't been scourged, right? Hasn't happened to me. Who knows, right? Doesn't sound fun, but don't want it. Okay? I haven't been in prison for my faith. I haven't been through any of those things. But I have had suffering in my life. I have gone through trials in my life. But guess what Paul is saying? That they are not worthy to be compared. You can't even go, are these even close? No. They're not, worth, they're not even close. They're on different, different planes. And so the suffering I have, the pain I go through, cannot compare to what God has for me in the future. Okay, I really encourage you to write Romans 8, 18. I think that is a powerful, powerful verse. Finally tonight, this is the final point. The person of comfort. Okay, so we have seen the need of comfort, the truth of comfort, and the, now the person of comfort. Did you know there's another passage that talks about comfort? Any, any thoughts on where that is? John chapter 14. John chapter 14. I really encourage you to go there. John chapter 14. I want you to see it in your Bible. John chapter 14. You see something pretty amazing. Jesus is talking to his disciples about what's going to happen, how he's going to die, what he's going to go through. But he wants them to understand something. Look at John chapter 14, verse 16. Look at what it says. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Do you notice something about that comforter there? Is that up? No, not up there. Okay. Do you see something about that comforter? What is it? It's a capital C. Meaning, it's the Holy Spirit. God gives us a comforter who indwells us. He is always there for comfort. He abides with us forever. Meaning, He's not going to leave you. Okay? That, that's a big thing. You think about the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit would come on people to empower them to do something, and then he would leave, and that does not happen in the New Testament church. Okay, For us, it, that does not happen. He doesn't come on and then leave. He stays with us forever. So, hmm. If I need comfort, guess what? It is readily available. If I need comfort in my life, it's not like I have to go do something to get it. Okay? He's already there. That's a powerful thing. But did you know this, that the comforter doesn't just comfort. He actually does something pretty cool. Look at John chapter 14, verse number 26. Okay, so just jump down there. About 10 verses. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, so he tells you very clearly who he is. Whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So what does he do? Not only is he the comforter, but he's actively teaching me things. So, we saw in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, that he comforts us, so we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble, right? So we can pass it on to somebody else. He's teaching us things. We saw in John 14, 26, that he teaches us all things, right? And he reminds us of the things that Jesus taught us. That is why it's so important for us to be in the word of God, okay? That's what he uses. That's how the Holy Spirit speaks to us is through his word. So if we are not actively studying it, we're going to run into issues, right? We need to actively study his word. This is the Holy Spirit. And this includes how to pass it on to other people. He's teaching us all things. So you go, 
Well, I have no idea how to bring up the trials that God has taught me to a teenager. I have no idea. Well, you know what you do? You go, hey, teenager, can I tell you something? This happened in my life, and this is what God did. Whoa, that's complicated, right? Wow, mind blown, Mr. Utley. That's insane. No, guess what? It's very simple. And I think as it becomes the norm, as it becomes a part of what we do, it will be more natural. Right now, you go, hey, teen, can I tell you something? They're like, who are you, right? You're old, right? They say that to me all the time, okay? No, you're old. Guess what? You have wisdom. And I think, honestly, our teenagers love the Lord enough to understand that. Okay? They don't look at you as some just old person. Okay? They look at you as somebody who can pass something on. And if they ever say, wow, you're old and you smell funny, tell me, and I'll have a good chat with them. Okay? <laughs> just saying. Okay? As it becomes more natural, as we do this, guess what we'll do? We'll do it more and more because we realize it's not that hard. You know, it wasn't really that hard for a dad to walk his son by the Jordan River and see a massive pile of rocks. All you had to do was go, hey, son, let's walk by the Jordan River. And you know where you're going. You're like, oh, that's a pile of rocks. Why is it there? Did some kid put it there? No. This is what God did. did have I told you about that before? Yeah, Dad, you told me a hundred times. Well, let me tell you again. This is what God did. I've always thought this would be a cool thing, okay? I'm not quite organized enough to do this, but I'm, I'm working on it, Okay? To actually write down in a journal the things that God has done in my life. Where I go, okay, don't know why I did that, but I'm going to write it down. This, I, I prayed this, I prayed this prayer, this was a prayer request I had, and this is how God answered. And you write the date. Okay, I'm just kidding. And you do it again. And you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again, and eventually you have these stacks of journals in your house. And one day when you die, guess what your kids have to go through? The stack of journals that shares what God has done in your life. And no longer is it just something you taught them. It's something when they're old enough to understand how important you really are. Okay? My grandpa told me this. He said, you don't understand how much your parents love you until you have your own kid. And that's so true. When they're old enough to actually appreciate you, they go, wow, let me see what Dad had to say. And they pull out this stack of journals and they go, wow, God did that? That's pretty cool. Wow, God did that? It's pretty awesome. And they go through page after page after page after page of year after year after year of what God did in their parents' life. That'd be pretty awesome. You know what I like to do in my Bible? I underline verses, I circle verses, I write my own notes in them. Okay? You know why? One day, Michaela, Josiah, they're going to pick up my Bible and they're going to go, well, let, this Bible's pretty worn out. Don't know what to do with it. And they see the notes of what God did in my life. That's a good thing. I think that's something we could all practice. Look at John chapter 15, verse number 26. John 15, so next chapter. If you look at it in your Bible, if you have a red letter Bible, there's a lot of red letters in this passage. Jesus is talking quite a bit about what is going on, what's going to happen. In John 15, 26, it says this, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. So what does this comforter do? What is part of his ministry? Part of his ministry is to say, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Did you know that's part of what he does? That he reminds you of what Jesus did throughout your life. He reminds you of your Savior during the, during the Christmas season. He reminds you to share your Savior during the Christmas season. He reminds you of who he is. He reminds you of what God wants you to do at the beginning of next year. When we all make our New Year's resolutions, which we all fail at, okay? But when we all make those resolutions, he'll say, hey, here's one. This is a good one for you. He'll remind you what Jesus taught you. He'll remind you of who Jesus is. Now, I think this is huge, okay? John chapter 16, verse number 7. 
this is, this is powerful. It says this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. You know what Jesus is saying? It's better for you if I leave. You go, what? That's Jesus. What? Wait, what? That's God in human flesh saying, look, it's better for you if I leave so that this comforter will come in unto you. But what does he do? Look at it. And look at verse 8. I know it didn't give this to David either. But in when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin. What does that mean? Convict, convince the world of sin. And of righteousness and of judgment. I don't know about you, but during trial, trials in my life, I go and I sometimes get, ah, I don't know, right? Well, maybe there are some ways I need to grow, right? You realize you haven't prayed in a long time and you start praying or you start getting into God's word like never before because you're in this trial. I, I think sometimes we get convicted in trial. And you go, wow, I wish I would have done this or I wish I would have made this change or wow, you know, it'd be nice if I could do this. And we get convicted. It's part of the Holy Spirit's job as the comforter. I, th I think for us tonight, I think what we have to understand, number one, okay, if, if I could just boil it all down, we have to understand the trials I have in my life are for me to grow. Okay, I think that is a good place for us just to start. Okay, the trials in my life are for me to grow. Okay? And as I go through that trial, I have the God of all comfort beside me, walking with me, never leave me, loves me more than I could possibly comprehend. And he also indwells me. And then we take that truth and we go, wow, that's a great truth. But then what we have to do is we have to take that truth, and I tell the teens all the time, if it's just up here and it never moves to where we actually do things, is it really that useful? Okay? This message is not just for your brain. This message is now meant to be lived. Okay? It's meant for you to now go, you know what? I know this person is going through a trial. I've been through that recently or, you know, 20 years ago, whatever. And you go, you know what? I think I can comfort them. And maybe we go outside of our comfort zone and, you know, we start sitting beside someone that we know is going through the same thing. And we start saying, hey, can I take you out to dinner? I want to talk to you. And you start encouraging them and you start loving on them and you start saying, hey, this is what God taught me. And guess what? That relationship will be stronger than ever. God did not allow that trial in your life just to teach you something. It's so that you can teach somebody else. The last, I want to read one more verse, and this is, this is a verse we've already read. I'm actually going to read two of them. And then after that, we're going to have our time of invitation. And I want us to be honest before God tonight. Okay? Let's read these verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. I want you to read along with me. I want you to think about it. It says this, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any, any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. I don't know about you tonight, but there are some changes I need to actively make. Okay? So what I encourage you to do is just everybody stand up. We're going to have a time of invitation.